Hey everyone, and welcome to What Did I Miss? My name is Eric. I hope that you enjoyed this compilation of all my Easter egg videos for Star Trek Lower Decks Season 4. If you ever get lost, there are time codes for each episode in the description below, and I have also put a tag in the upper left-hand corner of the video of which episode I am talking about. If you enjoy what you are watching, I hope that you will hit the like button to help support the work that I do. It does not cost you a penny, but it does a lot to help out my channel. Also, do not forget to subscribe so that YouTube lets you know when my future videos come out. So let's go over the first episode of the season, Tuvix. The title is a play on the name of the Voyager episode Tuvix, and there are many references to the episode and the series in general throughout this entry of Lower Decks. It is possible that since the third season of Picard referenced the series The Next Generation as well as Deep Space Nine so much, and that the series Strange New Worlds is constantly referencing the original series, that the producers on Lower Decks felt that Voyager needed its proper due as well, so they started this season with a love letter to fans of that show. A major new addition to the Lower Decks cast this season is the character Talyn, who first appeared in the second season episode titled Wedge Douge. In the season 3 finale episode, The Stars at Night, it was revealed that Talyn had transferred to the Cerritos to be trained by Ensign Tendi. Her name, Talyn, is derived from Lower Decks writer Catherine Lynn, who wrote the episode in which the character first appeared and cosplayed at conventions for several years as a Vulcan named Talyn before doing so. Boimler is assigned to empty the waste filters in the holodeck, which is a task that Commander Ransom also asked Beckett Mariner to perform in the second season episode, Moist Vessel. Ransom tells Boimler that he has a good chance of being promoted to Lieutenant Junior Grade before the day is over. This would be at least the second time that Bradward Boimler has accepted a promotion to this rank, as he was also promoted in the Season 1 finale, No Small Parts, as well as transferred to the USS Titan under the command of Captain William T. Riker. However, after a few mishaps that included him creating a transporter clone of himself, he was sent back to the Cerritos under the rank of Ensign. The captain reveals that their current mission is shrouded in secrecy until a Rigelian reveals that he is the caretaker of the original USS Voyager. This ship is the same one used by Captain Janeway and her crew for seven seasons in the Delta Quadrant on the series Star Trek Voyager. Chronologically, this is the first appearance of the ship since it returned to Earth in that series finale. But we did see the ship earlier in 2023, during the third season of Star Trek Picard, where it is positioned among the greatest ships in Starfleet history at the Fleet Museum. Boimler and Mariner briefly discuss what they refer to as that thing with Pike. This is a reference to the events that took place in the Season 2 Strange New Worlds crossover episode, Those Old Scientists, in which Boimler and Mariner were sent back in time to visit the crew of the Enterprise on that series, and their characters were played in live action by the actors who voiced the characters, Jack Quaid and Tawny Newsom, respectively. The Rigelian, whose name is Belho Twinkla, is voiced by comedian Andy Richter, who besides being the sidekick to Conan O'Brien for many years on his talk show, also was prom king at the same high school I went to in Yorkville, Illinois. Go Foxes! The intro for Lower Decks has been slightly different each season and has been updated once again for Season 4. Now, during the battle scene, the cylindrical ship that almost destroyed Earth in the film The Voyage Home has been added. Captain Freeman states in her log that the USS Voyager is being prepared to be sent to Starfleet Command, where she will be spending some time on the ground before the ship is sent back into space again, presumably at the Fleet Museum. But the fact that the Voyager will be on the ground is one of the unique things about the ship and the series she was on, as the USS Voyager was the only main ship on any series to land on a planet and leave orbit once again something that was seen on screen in the episode Demon. The plotline of Voyager and her crew being part of a museum was actually used in an episode of Voyager named Living Witness. In that episode, a copy of the EMH Doctor is reactivated hundreds of years after Voyager has left the Delta Quadrant, and he witnesses a group of aliens that have immortalized a fictionalized version of the crew as part of a museum exhibit. Tendi and Talyn work on getting Tuvok's old quarters set up when the petal from a flower starts to float around the ship similar to the leaf in the film Forrest Gump. Tuvok was known during his time on Voyager for cultivating plants and even crossbreeding them. It was while crossbreeding an orchid that Tuvok created a flower which led to the incident that caused him to be combined with the character Neelix. The same thing happens in this episode of Lower Decks after the petal lands on the transporter pad while Dr. Ta'ana and Chief Billups are attempting to transport off the ship. Even though this new character is supposed to be a cross of the Doctor and Billups, their shirt still has the same pattern that the character Tuvix had on his shirt in the Voyager episode. To make matters worse, an organism known as a macrovirus is released on the bridge shortly after the transporter accident. This macrovirus first appeared in the Voyager episode Macrocosm, 
where it started as a microscopic virus, but soon mutated into a much larger one. The virus also infected the crew on Voyager in that episode, but in this episode of Lower Decks, Boimler is told that he and the crew of the Cerritos have already been inoculated, so there's no way that he can be infected by it. The bioneural gel pack that the organism hides behind are another feature that is only known to be found on the USS Voyager. They help store more information and operated at faster speeds than isolinear circuitry, but also had many issues during the Voyager's mission. In the episode Macrocosm, the bioneural gel packs are also partly to blame for the release of the macrovirus. As the virus continues to spread on the ship, it is able to activate recreations of the holographic characters Chaotica, Clown, and Michael Sullivan. Dr. Chaotica was the mortal enemy of a pulp comic hero named Captain Proton that Tom Paris recreated in a holodeck program. The villain was able to capture the ship from the holodeck in the Voyager episode Bride of Chaotica. The Clown was a character that was featured in the Voyager episode The Thaw and was played brilliantly by one of the greatest guest stars that Star Trek has ever had, Michael McKeon. He was created from the fears of five individuals connected to a neural network and almost captured Harry Kim as well after the Voyager attempted to free them from the network. Michael Sullivan was a character that appeared in two episodes during the sixth season of Voyager and like Dr. Chaotica, was created by Tom Paris but lived in a recreated version of 19th century Ireland. Captain Janeway came to enjoy the company of this character and even changed the holodeck program so that his wife had died and then he would be single, which is why his hologram in this episode of Lower Decks mentions how he misses his wife. During the fight to catch the macrovirus, we also see a clarinet, which no doubt belonged to Harry Kim as he was seen playing the instrument in at least four episodes of Voyager. The macrovirus is assimilated by a Borg nanite after knocking over a Borg alcove, which were located in a cargo bay on Voyager and used by Seven of Nine as well as Echeb, two former members of the Borg that served on the ship from the fourth season on. At one point, we see two animatronic robots that look like salamanders. This is a reference to the Voyager episode Threshold, wherein Tom Paris and Captain Janeway break the Warp 10 barrier, forcing them to evolve into salamander-like creatures. Eventually, Rutherford is able to defeat the macrovirus by using old brilled cheese, and the crew is no longer spliced into one horrible being after Tendi and Talin work together. Before the episode ends, we see a Klingon ship in space, this is the same Klingon ship that was also featured in the episode Wage Dooge, which was the introduction of the Talin character. The Klingons are fired upon and destroyed by a mysterious ship. At the end of the third season of Lower Decks, the character Badgie was taken away by a mysterious force, and this ship would seem to be the evolution of that character, and perhaps others, from the first three seasons of Lower Decks. Let me know in the comments if you have any theories, and I'll let you know mine on my Monday podcast, WDIM News. So now let's go over all the Easter eggs in the second episode titled, I Have No Bones, Yet I Must Flee. The title of the episode is a reference to the Harlan Ellison sci-fi story, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream, which is about an AI that led to the destruction of civilization. Harlan Ellison also wrote the original series episode, The City on the Edge of Forever, although, due to a feud the writer had with Gene Roddenberry, his contribution to Star Trek is rarely mentioned, and he is sometimes credited by a pseudonym. The episode begins with the same small ship that destroyed the Klingon ship at the end of the last episode, destroying a Romulan vessel in the same manner. Before getting destroyed, one of the Romulans mentions that he is cleaning off the remains of a Reman, who are a race of aliens that were introduced in the film Nemesis and were once a slave caste of the Romulan people. While working out in the Cerritos gym, Ransom and Shax are wearing the same outfits worn by Crusher and Troy in the TNG episode The Price, and are also doing a similar exercise. The Cerritos is on a mission to rescue two humans that have been captured and was referred to as a menagerie by Commander Ransom. This is also the title of a very important first season episode of Star Trek's original series that first introduced the viewing audience to the character Captain Christopher Pike. Next, we get two references to episodes that revolved around the character Q. First, during the tour of the menagerie, there is a creature that looks like a crystal ball with three snakes attached to it. This is the same being that Q appeared as to the crew of the Enterprise-D, in the TNG episode Hide and Q. Later in this episode of Lower Decks, Boimler witnesses Dr. Ta'ana and Shax enter the holodeck to use a program based on Robin Hood. This is a reference to the TNG episode Cupid, in which Q sends Picard and other members of the Enterprise D bridge crew into Sherwood Forest and the story of Robin Hood. While Rutherford is trying to impress everyone and get a promotion, he creates a modification to a device referred to as the Tucker Tubes. These two tubes with light running through them have been seen on every Star Trek series but have never been named on screen before. Their name is presumably a nod to the chief engineer on the NX-01 Enterprise, Trip Tucker. 
It is ironic that in this episode of Lower Decks, Ensign Livick names his new device with three tubes after Billups, not someone named Trip. Part of Boimler's promotion includes moving into his own quarters, and the first ones he gets are right by the warp nacelle. When he sees the bright light, Boimler puts on a visor with a red shield, which is the same one worn by Spock in the original series episode titled, Is There In Truth No Beauty? While Boimler is moving his things, you can see a Starfleet recruitment poster featuring number one and the quote, Ad Astra Per Aspera, which is also featured in the Strange New Worlds crossover episode, Those Old Scientists. You can also see part of Boimler's Tom Paris plate from the season two Lower Decks episode, We'll Always Have Tom Paris amongst its things. Rutherford reveals that he's actually turned down at least three promotions before the events of this episode. The events that he references are saving the Cerritos from the pack lids, which took place during the first season finale episode, No Small Parts. Rutherford also mentions saving the USS Rubido from a space jellyfish, which was shown in the first season episode, Much Ado About Boimler, as well as the time he removed the Cerritos' hull during the season two finale, First First Contact. Once in his new room, Boimler puts up his action figures which includes Spock from the film era, as well as the Mirror Universe version of Jonathan Archer from the Enterprise episode titled In a Mirror Darkly. The episode ends with Boimler and Rutherford now sharing a room together. Rutherford starts messing around with a new project that looks very similar to the one created by Wesley Crusher in the TNG episode The Naked Now. The basis of this episode is that Vexilon, a supercomputer that completely controls a space station, is malfunctioning and the crew of the Cerritos is sent to help. A supercomputer controlling a society is a plot device that has been used a few times before on Star Trek, probably most notably in the original series episode The Return of the Archons, which saw the crew of the Enterprise help free the inhabitants of the planet Beta-3 from a computer named Landru. The Cerritos actually visited the planet Beta-3 in the first season Lower Decks episode No Small Parts and discovered that Landru had taken over the planet once again after it was defeated by Captain Kirk in the original series episode. It is established that Vexilon was built thousands of years ago by an alien species that are not the same species of alien living there now. This is a quick throwaway line at the beginning of the episode that I think may have a connection to the season's villain. The ship must be some type of advanced form of technology after it seemingly destroyed both a Klingon and Romulan vessel in the first and second episode this season. It is also notable that after seeing the ship in action in the first two episodes, there is no mention of it in this episode. I think there's a strong possibility that we will learn eventually that whoever built this station is somehow connected to the Big Bad this season. To emphasize how old Vexilon is, the memory banks that Captain Freeman is using are designed to look like the floppy disks that everyone used in the 80s and early 90s to store and transfer computer information. This episode marks the first time each of the Lower Decks crew are the rank of Lieutenant Junior Grade after their promotion in the last episode. Boimler is also in command of three other ensigns, one of whom, Taylor, is a Kazinti, who are a race of cat-like aliens that were introduced on the original animated series episode, The Slaver Weapon. I also thought the newest main cast member, Talyn, had a mic drop moment early in the episode with this line. Everything that has ever occurred is science stuff. Yes, science! Back on the ship, the Lower Deckers come upon something they refer to as the Anomaly Storage Room, which houses quite a few Star Trek relics. There is a Vulcan bladed weapon known as a Lerpa, which was first seen in the original series episode, Amok Time. There is also a version of the Nomad Probe, another example of early artificial intelligence from the original series episode, The Changeling. Next we see a Klingon Batleth, which were first seen in the fourth season Next Generation episode titled Reunion. There is also a Betazoid gift box, which was presented as a wedding gift to Deanna Troy in the Next Generation episode Haven. The part of the gift box in that episode was played by Armin Shimmerman, which was just one of his roles on TNG before he starred as Quark for seven seasons on Deep Space Nine. Rutherford mentions the game Chula, which was brought from the Gamma Quadrant by a group of aliens known as Wadi in the Deep Space Nine episode Move Along Home. Of all the controversial plot lines that took place on DS9, Move Along Home may still be the one episode that causes the most debate among fans, as some see it as the worst episode of Star Trek ever, while others, like me, see it as a testament to how great and diverse Star Trek can be. Although even some of the actors from the episode have voiced, let's say, their displeasure with how it turned out. <laughs> you remember this? When Rutherford first mentions the game, behind him on a shelf, you can see a Romulan cloaking device from the original series episode, The Enterprise Incident. Mariner, Rutherford, and Tendi are then tasked with finding a faulty isolinear chip. These are an advanced form of computer chip utilized as an information storage device or for the operation control of systems on a ship. They are an advancement of 24th century technology 
They were first mentioned and seen during the Season 1 Next Generation episode, The Naked Now. The handheld devices they are using to scan the chips look to be the T88 diagnostic tools that both Rutherford and Tendy were excited about getting in the Season 1 episode, Cupid's Air and Arrow. Also running around the ship is the lost ferret of Chief Billups, who he has named Lancelot, a character from the stories of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Since Andy Billups is from a planet named Hysperia, which was colonized by humans who wanted to live in a world based on Arthurian legend, it makes sense that he would name his pet after one of the characters from those stories. This may also be a reference to Porthos, the canine companion of Captain Jonathan Archer on the series Star Trek Enterprise, who is named after the character from the story the Three Musketeers. The update that Captain Freeman attempts does not initially work and it causes all kinds of extreme weather, which also creates plenty of obstacles for Boimler and his crew. The station continues to unravel as the captain is unable to get the computer to reboot. While this is going on, Talyn quotes the most important Vulcan, Spock, in her assessment of the events. Fascinating. 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 Back on the ship, the Lower Decks crew create a booby trap for their commanding officer, who's named Dirk, using the Wadi Chula game. After learning that the officer was trapped in one before, Rutherford attempts to take it down and gets trapped in it himself. Personally, I'm a huge fan of the Deep Space Nine episode Move Along Home, and I encourage you to watch it yourself. But in that episode, four members of the DS9 crew get trapped in a virtual reality of sorts that is also being played in the real world by Quark on the station. It seems in this episode that Rutherford is able to get himself out of the game without help from the outside world. While Rutherford is trapped in the game, Mariner is stuck talking to Lieutenant Dirk about Tellarite Slop Jazz. At one point, he says someone got hooked on Ketracel White, which is an addictive narcotic created by the Vorta in an effort to control the obedience of the Jem'Hadar to the Dominion, something that Dr. Bashir tried to free them from in the DS9 episode Hippocratic Oath. Lieutenant Dirk is voiced by frequent Lower Decks voice actor Phil Lamar, who now has the distinction of being one of the many actors who play characters on both Star Trek and Babylon 5, after he voiced an animated version of the character Dr. Stephen Franklin in the new film Babylon 5 The Road Home. I did do a review of that film that I will link in the description of this video that you should check out if you want to know what happens and don't want to have to sit through it. When Rutherford escapes the game, he is almost zapped by a device from the anomaly storage room that I think is supposed to be the same one from the Next Generation episode The Inner Light, where Captain Picard is zapped by a probe and given the memories of a lost alien culture and he also learns how to play the flute. On the station, Boimler and his team are able to restart the computer but Boimler appears to be killed in the process. He awakens in a room with a picture of a black mountain and is visited by a koala bear. The black mountain and the koala bear that rule the universe have been referenced on Lower Decks before by other characters that have died and then come back. Like Shax, who said the black mountain was a spiritual battleground where the soul went after death. After he reappeared in the second season and explained what happened to him to Rutherford in the episode We'll Always Have Tom Paris. Also, the character Steve Stevens mentioned seeing a koala sitting on top of a black mountain after his near-death experience in the third season episode, Mining the Mind's Minds. This room also seems to be a reference to the Red Room, a sort of purgatory shown in the series Twin Peaks. If you reverse what the koala bear says to Boimler in this scene, he says, it is not your time, Bradward Boimler. One of the advantages of producing an animated series is that you are able to show things on screen that may be too costly or otherwise too difficult to pull off on a live action series. This week's episode is a perfect example of this as the audience is given an intimate look at the race of aliens known as the Orion, who are actually one of the earliest alien races that Gene Roddenberry created for Star Trek. There were also some pretty funny callbacks to the next generation as well as Enterprise along with a surprise cameo voice appearance from one of the stars of perhaps the most successful family sitcom ever produced. But before I get into all of that, I want to thank you for clicking on this video and ask that you hit that like button to help support the channel. Don't forget to also subscribe for future videos. The title of this episode is a reference to the wedding poem Something Old, Something New, Something Borrowed, and Something Blue, which is meant to represent well wishes offered by friends and family on a couple's wedding day. Within this episode, this is a reference to the various Orion wedding customs that Devon Attendee has to endure on her sister's wedding day. As I mentioned, the Orions are one of the oldest alien races in Star Trek as one appeared to Captain Pike as a hologram in the original pilot episode The Cage, although the most well-known Orion from the original series would probably be Marta from the episode Whom Gods Destroy. She was played by actress Yvonne Craig from the 1960s Batman series. Before taking on the part of Marta, 
Miss Craig was almost cast as Vina in the episode The Cage, which led to her being cast as an Orion in the third season of TOS. The Orion were not used again after appearing in the original animated series until the series Star Trek Enterprise episode titled Bound, where their culture was shown to be a matriarchy in which the women actually held most of all the power within their society. The series also established that female Orions emit a pheromone which can intoxicate heterosexual males into being highly suggestible and easily manipulated. On Star Trek Discovery, we learned that in the 31st century that Orions had become a power in the galaxy during the show's third season. Devon Attendee stated in the first episode of Lower Decks, Second Contact, that she is the first Orion to serve in Starfleet. Since that episode, Lower Decks has been teasing a hidden story behind Tendi. In the second season episode, We'll Always Have Tom Paris, we started to learn about her family as well as hearing her full title, which is Mistress of the Winter Constellation. Then, the Strange New Worlds crossover episode, Those Old Scientists, introduced Devon Attendee's ancestor, who is part of a small group of Orion dedicated to science. The Orion people are controlled by the Orion Syndicate, which is a criminal organization tied to piracy. And no, I'm not talking about pirate bay style piracy. I'm talking about Jack Sparrow in space style piracy, as they do everything that pirates do, but in space. There are many connections between naval terms and nautical procedures to what we see officers do in Starfleet, including similarities in rank and how the ships are laid out. Hell, even the USS Enterprise got its name from the nuclear-powered aircraft carrier that was launched by the U.S. Navy in 1958. So it makes sense that there be pirates here as well, matey. Sorry, I promise. That's my last pirate speak in this episode. Arg, but you can't trust a pirate, can ye? Sorry, I promise I'll stop now. Uh, the episode begins with an Orion ship being destroyed by the same mysterious ship that destroyed a Klingon vessel in the first episode this season, then a Romulan one in the second episode. I have a pretty good theory of what is going on with this thing that I discussed in my podcast earlier this week, WDIM News, that I have linked in the description if you would like to check that out after this video. Before the Orion get destroyed, we see members of the crew going over some of their loot from their last pirate thing, which I believe is known as Booty. In the room, there is a Vulcan Lerpa, which is a bladed weapon first introduced in the original series episode, Amok Time. There is also a Klingon Batleth, an angrier style of bladed weapon, first introduced in the Next Generation episode, Reunion as well as some Starfleet Type 2 hand phasers on the table, which are introduced on the series Star Trek The Next Generation in their pilot episode Encounter at Farpoint. There are also some phasers from the original series and the films with that cast, which the Orion throws out in the trash. After the intro, Tendi gets an invitation to return home for her sister's wedding that she is less than enthusiastic about, but the captain sees it as an opportunity to learn more about the Orion culture. Mariner and new Lower Decker Talin decide to join in as well and take the audience to the Orion home planet for the first time in Star Trek history. Meanwhile, Boimler and Rutherford are enjoying sharing quarters together and each have some very interesting Star Trek memorabilia in their room. On Boimler's side, you can see his Tom Paris commemorative plate that actually spoke to him in the episode We'll Always Have Tom Paris. Boimler also has three figurines which appear to be a mirror universe version of Jonathan Archer, Spock from the original series film era, and Catherine Janeway with her signature hair bun. On Rutherford's side, there is a model of Deep Space Nine that he received as a gift from Tendi in the second season episode, An Embarrassment of Duplers. Also, the colors on the corner of the box match Wesley Crusher's infamous sweater that he wore towards the beginning of his appearances on The Next Generation. Rutherford's obsession with Wesley Crusher continues as the next thing on his shelf is the science project that Wesley was working on in the TNG episode The Naked Now. After Rutherford and Boimler get into a fight, they decide to work out their differences in a holodeck program in which they both portray author Samuel Clemens aka Mark Twain. This is a reference to the Next Generation two-part episode Time's Arrow in which Data and several members of the Enterprise-D crew take part in a time paradox and along the way they travel to 19th century San Francisco and meet the real Samuel Clemens. When Tendi, Mariner, and Talin arrive on Orion, they are thrown into a rescue mission, which is also a type of Orion ritual. Tendi takes them to a club named Slit Throat, where she has to take part in a deadly drinking game with an old friend. There, Mariner asks about the female Orion's ability to use pheromones to enthrall men, and she says, Yeah, Tendi's made it clear that Starfleet made those pheromones up. I mean, they had to explain why a captain would get taken out by some Orion showgirls. This is a reference to the aforementioned Star Trek Enterprise episode Bound, where three Orion women almost take over the NX-01 Enterprise, by turning the men on the ship against each other. After Boimler and Rutherford make up, they are called to the bridge, where Captain Freeman is having issue with another captain, who is Chalinoff, an aggressive species that was first introduced in the Next Generation episode, Allegiance. And I cannot confirm this as of recording this video, but I believe that this character is voiced by Star Trek veteran actor J.G. Hertzler, who is best known for playing the Klingon General Martok on Deep Space Nine, 
but he has appeared in other roles on many Star Trek series, including three previous episodes of Lower Decks. There may be a quick hint to the casting of J.G. Hertzler earlier in this episode when Mariner describes their new lives as Lieutenant Junior Grade. One of the great things about being a Lieutenant J.G. is it's actually possible to finish your work. The issue between the USS Cerritos and Coker is a nebula that phase shifts through time and is only able to be studied until it disappears again. This is possibly a reference to the Deep Space Nine episode titled Meridian, where a planet and its inhabitants phase out of existence for 60 years and then reappear for only 12 days until they disappear again. On the planet Orion, Tendi and the others come across a Raven-class ship which Tendi says she used to play in as a child. This is the same type of ship that a young Annika Hansen, aka Seven of Nine, and her parents were in when they were attacked and assimilated by the Borg, event shown in the Voyager episode titled The Raven. In the ship, they are come upon by Tendi's sister and the person they are all looking for, De Erica. She is voiced by actress Ariel Winter, who most will recognize from her role as Alex Dunphy on the Emmy Award-winning series Modern Family, where she also played the youngest sister in her household. After the sisters make amends, the episode ends with Boimler and Rutherford planning the next addition to their room. Today we were arguing about whether to hang an oil painting of the Enterprise D or a watercolor of the Enterprise D. This is a reference to the oil painting of the Enterprise D that hung in the Reading Room during the series The Next Generation, and then after the ship was almost destroyed in the film Star Trek Generations, it hung in the study of Chateau Picard during the series Star Trek Picard. The title of the episode comes from the term pathological fallacy, which is an error of overgeneralization wherein traits seen in one person or in a limited set of people are generalized and credited to a larger group of related people. In regard to the plotline of this episode, it's a reference to the feelings that Talin has toward her new crewmates on the USS Cerritos, which she finds may be misguided, as well as how Boimler assumes that he understands what it means to be a security officer before he actually gets to experience it. The main plot of the episode involves the USS Cerritos having to transport a group of diplomats who are Betazoid. Betazoids are a telepathic race of black-eyed aliens that were introduced on the series The Next Generation through main cast member Deanna Troy, who is played by actress Marina Sirtis. Since only her mother is a Betazoid and her father a human, Deanna does not possess telepathic abilities like many others of her race, but she does possess heightened empathic abilities, which may be referenced in the title of this episode as well. Although, Deanna has been shown to be able to communicate telepathically at times with her husband William Riker and others. The three Betazoid diplomats are voiced by a group of actresses that have voiced characters and also starred in hundreds of episodes of television combined. The character Catrot is voiced by actress Janelle James, who is one of the stars of the very popular series Abbott Elementary, as well as voices a character on the animated series Central Park. Kathyu is voiced by Wendy Malick, who is one of the most successful actresses in television history, having starred in a recurring role in some of the most popular series over the last 30 years, such as Just Shoot Me, Dream On, Frasier, and she currently stars on the series Young Sheldon. Delorax is voiced by Rachel Dratch, who starred for seven seasons on the sketch comedy series Saturday Night Live, and has had many other roles in television and film. While Counselor Troy may be the most popular Betazoid in Star Trek history, these three envoys seem to be based on her mother, Loxana Troy. That character was introduced during the first season Next Generation episode titled Haven, but the actress who played her, Major Barrett Ronberry, was already well known to fans of Star Trek. Besides being the wife of Star Trek creator Gene Ronberry, she also starred as number one to Captain Pike in the series pilot titled The Cage, and then later on as Nurse Chapel, serving under Captain Kirk, on the original series, two characters that are now being reintroduced to fans on the new series Star Trek Strange New Worlds. The episode begins with a log by new Lower Decks character Talin to her former superior asking for a transfer back to a Vulcan ship. Due to the security blackout on the Cerritos though, she is unable to and ultimately decides not to send the message at the end of the episode. This reminded me of the pilot episode of Deep Space Nine titled The Emissary, in which then Commander Benjamin Sisko tells Captain Picard that he intends to transfer off the station, but by the end of the episode, the Commander instead decides to stay and asks the Captain not to send his request for transfer. Having a Vulcan serve on a Starfleet vessel who is actually not a member of the organization is very similar to how the character T'Pol came to be a part of the bridge crew of the NX-01 Enterprise under Captain Archer. Although her role as sub-commander was supposed to only last for one mission, she too decided to stay aboard the ship in the Star Trek Enterprise pilot episode, Broken Bow. Talin has been transferred to Starfleet from the Vulcan High Command due to her actions during the second season episode Wage Duge, which not only introduced the character Talin, but also other Lower Decks crews from various alien ships. Ironically, she was transferred due to her perceived lack of emotional control while serving on a Vulcan ship, which is something that also gets her into trouble in this episode. 
The USS Cerritos is taking three Betazoid diplomats to the planet Ryza, which is a pleasure planet that was first introduced in the Next Generation episode, Captain's Holiday, which showed the audience more of Captain Picard than most thought we would ever see. While touring the ship, Kathy turns down an advance by Commander Ransom and says that she likes men that are hard to get. This is probably a reference to the relationship between Luxana Troy and Odo, the changeling security chief of Deep Space Nine, which began in the first season episode The Forsaken, one of the most underrated episodes of any Star Trek series. Catrot mentions that she got a hat that says it's Romulan Ale O'Clock Somewhere from some gal on Angel One. Angel One is a planet that is ruled by females and was introduced in the Next Generation first season episode of the same name, which showed us more of Commander Riker than most of us thought we would ever see. While the Betazoids head to the bar, Boimler is taken in by Shax, who along with Rutherford agree to show him some special type of security training. Boimler believes that he will be learning a new fighting style and asks if he will be taught Tsunkatsu, which is a combat style sport that was introduced in the Voyager episode of the same name, an episode that is mostly remembered for including in a guest starring role an electrifying sports entertainer that went on to become one of the highest grossing box office stars in the world, Dwayne Johnson. At the bar on the Cerritos, the crew seems to get more and more unhinged as time goes on. At first, the crew believe the cause of this are one or all of the Betazoid diplomats due to a condition known as Xanthi fever, which is a physiological condition that Betazoid women of a certain age get that causes them to project their own emotions onto others, something that afflicted Luxana Troy in the Deep Space Nine episode Fascination. After Boimler correctly guesses that his Temerian shipmate Kayshawn is trying to emulate Constable Odo during a game of charades, Kayshawn says, So God, his eyes open. <laughs> this is almost exactly what a Temerian said to Captain Picard in the fifth season Next Generation episode titled Darmok. So God, his eyes uncovered. Boimler is then asked to complete one of two secret security officer challenges. The first option is to complete a thousand piece puzzle of Malcolm Reed and the ship he served on, the NX-01 Enterprise. Malcolm Reed, played by Dominic Keating for four seasons on Star Trek Enterprise, was technically the first security officer to serve on a United Earth ship, which would become Starfleet. He is also responsible for many of the security procedures still used on Starfleet ships, such as the Red Alert, which was almost known as the Reed Alert. Reed Alert? That's not bad. Mariner and Talin learn that Talin is the one projecting emotions onto the crew telepathically, and that it may be because of something called Bendai Syndrome, which is a very rare degenerative neurological illness affecting Vulcans over the age of 200. As mentioned in this episode of Lower Decks, Spock's father, Sarek, became afflicted by this disease towards the end of his life, something that he tried to hide from the crew of the USS Enterprise-D in the Next Generation third season episode titled Sarek. In that episode, the crew of the Enterprise-D begin fighting with each other and eventually start a brawl in 10 forward, much like how one begins in the bar of the Cerritos during this episode of Lower Decks. Sarek was played on the original series and in four films by another veteran Star Trek actor, Mark Leonard, who besides playing Sarek, also played the Romulan commander in the episode Balance of Terror, as well as a Klingon captain in the Star Trek original motion picture. During this revelation, we also learn that Talin is 62 years old, which may seem on the older side, but Vulcans age at about half the rate that humans do. For reference, Spock was just 23 years old when he joined the USS Enterprise, T'Pol was 62 years old when she joined the NX-01 Enterprise, and Tuvok was 107 years old when he joined the USS Voyager. The Betazoids turn out to be secret agents and take over the ship. They plan to take the Cerritos back to their home planet Beta Z, which would take the ship through the Romulan neutral zone. On the map, you can see the planet Sharon, which is a deep cut reference to an episode of the original series titled Let That Be Your Last Battlefield which is usually the episode that Trek fans reference when people say that Star Trek was never political. Mariner tells Tendi and Rutherford about Talin's affliction, but they are too far gone to help them. In the background, you can see the character Big Murph playing the same addictive headset game that Wesley Crusher and others did on the Enterprise-D in the Next Generation episode titled The Game. While the ship descends into chaos, Mariner tries to protect Talin from the rest of the crew while also trying to save her mother. As they run through the ship, they pass two crew members who look to be taking part in Anbo Jitsu, a form of martial arts that both William Riker and his father competed in, as seen in the Next Generation episode titled The Icarus Factor. Close to the end of the episode, Mariner says one of the funniest lines I think I've ever heard on Star Trek. Can you imagine anything more Vulcan than Bendai Syndrome? Hello? I mean, Spock's dad had it and he was Vulcan as a motherfucker. The title of the episode is a reference to British comedy horror miniseries Garth Marenghi's Dark Place that starred Matthew Holness and Richard Aote and was about a lost fictional TV series from the 90s. The episode begins with a couple of Ferengi going through a weapons cache that they have been ordered to destroy. 
The Ferengi are a race of aliens that first appeared on the series The Next Generation in an episode titled The Last Outpost, and were created by the man who originally conceived Star Trek itself, Gene Roddenberry. Initially, they were designed to be the main foe of the crew of the Enterprise-D, much like the Klingons were on the original series, as the Klingons were designed to be a reflection of the U.S. tensions with Russia during the Cold War, the Ferengi were designed as a reflection of the excess of capitalism during the 1980s. Herbert Wright, the man who wrote the screenplay for the episode The Last Outpost, and who helped Mr. Ronberry design the Ferengi, stated that he designed them to be a species of profit-obsessed, ruthless aliens, which created a stark contrast between them and the crew of the Enterprise-D, who had no desire or need for money. However, when the Ferengi were introduced on screen, they came off more like angry gerbils than serious enemies, which led to the development of a new big bad for the Enterprise-D crew to face, who eventually became the Borg. The Ferengi were then given a proper redesign and brought back on the next new Star Trek series after TNG, Deep Space Nine. Instead of jumping around in loincloth, the Ferengi now were more akin to shrewd businessmen and were legitimized in large part by actors Armin Shimmerman and Max Grudenchik, who not only played the brothers Quark and Rom on the show, but were also instrumental in the development of their characters. Max Grudenchik reprises his role as Rom for this episode after Armin Shimmerman reprised his role as Quark last season on Lower Decks in the episode Here All Trust Nothing. As the Ferengi go through the weapons, they stumble upon what looks like a missile that they refer to as a Genesis device. This is the MacGuffin that Khan, Nooney, and Singh was able to steal from the Federation and then detonated in an effort to kill James Kirk and the crew of the USS Enterprise in the film The Wrath of Khan. It should also be noted that before this mysterious ship appeared in the fourth episode of the season, Something Borrowed, Something Green, members of an Orion ship were also going through a cargo of stolen weapons. This may line up with my ongoing theory about this strange craft and its origins. If you're curious about my theory about this season's villains, please check out my weekly podcast, WGIM News, which comes out every Monday. You can check out the link in the description of this video. The Ferengi voiced their frustration about the fact that Grand Nagus Rom does not want to sell these weapons for profit. The Grand Nagus is for all intents and purposes the king of the Ferengi Alliance, and throughout most of the series Deep Space Nine, this role was filled by a character named Zek, played by actor Wallace Shawn. INCONCEIVABLE! While Zek was your average Ferengi ruler for most of his life, he was eventually convinced to reform many aspects of Ferengi culture by his new love, who just happened to be Quark and Rom's mother. This led Zek to transfer his power as Nagus to Rom in the seventh season episode Dogs of War due to Rom not living or acting like an old school Ferengi. Rom had a very interesting character arc on Deep Space Nine, where he started out working in his brother's bar while raising his son Nog, who was played by Aaron Eisenberg. Unlike most Ferengi, it was perceived that Rom did not have a head for business, which led to his wife leaving him and his son not having much respect for him at first. However, Rom shows that he is something of a miracle worker when it comes to fixing things around the station, which leads him to pursue his own career working under Chief Miles O'Brien as an engineer. It is also during this time that Rom begins a relationship with Lita, who is played by Chase Masterson and who also reprises her role for this episode. She began on the series as a Dabo girl at Quark's Bar, but eventually becomes a strong voice for workers' rights and reform. After they decide to marry, Rom's history of being a non-conventional Ferengi leads Zek to believe that he is the perfect choice to lead the Ferengi into a new era of reform and selects Rom as his successor. I'm obviously skipping over a lot of great things that happen on Deep Space Nine concerning the Ferengi, like Nog's whole character arc, as well as the events in some classic episodes like the Magnificent Ferengi. But needless to say, that the Ferengi are a race of aliens that really benefited from their second life on Deep Space Nine and the efforts of Armin Shimmerman and Max Redenschik. On the Ferengi ship, a member of the crew quotes the 60-second Rule of Acquisition, which is also stated in the Deep Space Nine episodes Rules of Acquisition and Little Green Men. The Rules of Acquisition are the governing laws of the Ferengi culture, and all Ferengi are required to memorize them. They were written by the first Grand Nagus over 10,000 years ago, and there are believed to be at least 285 rules in total. USS Cerritos arrives at the planet Ferenginar, which was visited frequently on DS9 and is said to be always raining. When they do, the Admiral in charge makes a comment about the planet Moab 4. This planet was shown in the Next Generation episode titled The Masterpiece Society, which was about a colony of genetically modified humans living within a biosphere on this desolate planet. Ron and Lita enter the room with a Hyperion servant who looks very much like Zek's servant, Mehardu that appeared in seven episodes of Deep Space Nine and was played by actor Tiny Ron Taylor. When the crew arrives on Ferenginar, there are advertisements everywhere for a soft drink known as Sluggo Cola. This drink first appeared in the Deep Space Nine episode, Profit and Lace. Drink Sluggo Cola, the slimiest cola in the galaxy. Mariner goes to meet a friend of hers whose name is Quimp, 
This character was first introduced in the first season Lower Decks episode, titled Envoys, and is once again voiced by Tom Kenny, who is most well known for being the voice of the character SpongeBob SquarePants. After Quimp learns of Mariner's promotion, he says, I never thought you'd dig your way out of crashing that Oberth. He is probably referring to an Oberth-class Federation ship. The first Oberth-class ship seen on screen, the ill-fated USS Grissom, was shown in the film The Search for Spock. Mariner asks the waiter for a drink called And a Dagger of the Mind on the Rocks. Dagger of the Mind is the name of an episode from the first season of the original series in which Captain Kirk is tortured on a penal colony. Back on the ship, the negotiations seem to hit a snag when Nagus Ram only wants to talk about baseball. This is a reference to the classic DS9 episode, Take Me Out to the Hollow Suite, in which members of the crew play a game of baseball against a team of Vulcans and where Ram is responsible for their only run of the game. This may also be a reference to actor Max Gradenchik's history as a semi-professional baseball player before he started his career as an actor. Boimler becomes obsessed with Ferengi pop culture and starts binging every series he can find. This is very similar to how Neelix and Kess got sucked into watching soap operas while monitoring the Earth when they went back to the 90s in the Voyager episode Future's End. Meanwhile, Tendi and Rutherford are trying not to actually become a couple while appearing as a couple on the planet. Their host at their hotel, Parth, is voiced by comedian Dave Foley, who has had a very successful career in television, but who I will always remember as one of the kids in the hall, which is a Canadian sketch comedy group consisting of Mr. Foley and four other men. Dave Foley has professed his love for Star Trek many times before in interviews, but he is not the first member of the kids in the hall to appear on a series. That honor goes to Scott Thompson, who appeared in the Star Trek Voyager episode titled Someone to Watch Over Me. They are taken to a restaurant named Quark's Federation Experience Bar and Grill, which is a reference to the Quark's Bar at the Star Trek Experience in Las Vegas, Nevada, which was an immersive attraction that was open from 1998 until 2008. Eventually, Captain Freeman is able to trick Grand Nagus Rom into a bad deal, which impresses him enough to agree to a more standard contract. In doing so, he quotes the eighth rule of acquisition. Small print leads to large risk. This rule was never actually quoted on screen, but was used in a book that was published in 1995 called The Rules of Acquisition that was written by DS9 show writer Ira Stephen Bear. Boimler has not left his hotel room and tells Commander Ransom that all he has been doing is watching Ferengi programming. Ransom sends in Ferengi security to rescue him and the security officer is using the same kind of energy whip that the Ferengi used in their first appearance in the Next Generation episode, The Last Outpost. The title of the episode is a reference to the classic Sergio Leone Spaghetti Western film For A Few Dollars More, which starred Clint Eastwood. This is the second time that Star Trek has referenced a movie created by this duo after the Next Generation episode A Fistful of Datas was an homage to the film A Fistful of Dollars. This episode begins with a flashback as we see a Drukmani ship retrieve some salvage that turns out to be the remnants of the advanced artificial intelligence known as Badgy. This is the second time that Lower Decks viewers have seen this scene as in the season 3 finale, The Stars at Night, we saw a mysterious tractor beam retrieve the remains of Badgy from the wreckage of a pack led ship. Badgie is just one of the AIs featured in this entry of Lower Decks, and he was first created by Rutherford in the Season 1 episode, Terminal Provocations. Rutherford meant for Badgie to act as a training program on the holodeck, similar to the old real-world pop-up Microsoft Office assistant program Clippy, which is what Badgie is also based on. However, due to a malfunction, Badgie became very hostile to the point where Rutherford had to kill him, then rebooted the program, thinking that Badgie would have no memory of their prior engagement. This was not the case, and Badgie plotted his revenge until the Season 1 finale of Lower Decks, No Small Parts, where Badgie almost destroyed the Cerritos and its crew after Rutherford tried to use Badgie to help defeat the attacking Packlets. In the end, Shax seemingly sacrificed himself and ripped Rutherford's eyepiece from his head after Badgie initiated a self-destruct device on the Packlet ship. It is Rutherford's old eyepiece that the Drukmani are able to salvage in this episode. Badgie is voiced by actor and comedian Jack McBriar, who most people would probably recognize from his role on the old NBC series 30 Rock or from his appearances in the films Talladega Nights and Forgetting Sarah Marshall. The Drukmani are an alien species that so far have only appeared on the series Lower Decks, having been introduced in the Season 1 episode that I just mentioned, Terminal Provocations. After the intro, we see another ship get attacked by the mysterious spacecraft that we have been following for most of the season. The ship that is attacked belongs to the Binars, who are a race of cybernetically enhanced humanoids that live and work in groups of two and were introduced in the Next Generation episode 11001001. Coincidentally, that episode dealt with the crew of the Enterprise having to deal with a compromised holodeck program, very similar to how the Lower Decks crew must deal with Badgie in this episode. On the Cerritos, 
Rutherford is trying to attach a grappler hook to a shuttlecraft, and Boimler, along with Mariner, both agree that they are fans of the technology. This is a reference to the grappling hook that the NX-01 Enterprise had during its time on the series Star Trek Enterprise. Live-action versions of Boimler, Mariner, and others also stated their reference for this device in the Star Trek Strange New Worlds crossover episode, Those Old Scientists. So they had the NX-01 there, Archer's Enterprise. Yeah, yeah, classic design, plus it had, you know, the grapplers. Skip that part, they don't care. I love grapplers. See? After the Cerritos receives a distress call from the Binar ship, they are dispatched to the scene. But not everyone will be going with, as Tendi and Boimler are given orders to travel to Daystrom Institute. The Daystrom Institute is a Starfleet scientific research facility that was first introduced in the Next Generation episode, The Measure of a Man, and is named after Richard Daystrom, a character that first appeared in the original series episode, The Ultimate Computer, and who is responsible for many advancements in the Star Trek universe in the field of robotics. Tendi is there to witness the parole hearing of a character named Peanut Hamper, who debuted in the Season 1 Lower Decks episode, No Small Parts. Peanut Hamper is an exocomp, which are utility robots that were designed to perform menial and sometimes dangerous tasks, but were shown to be sentient in the Next Generation episode, The Quality of Life. After starting as a member of the Cerritos crew, Peanut Hamper refused an order by the captain that would have put her in danger, and subsequently abandoned the ship during a time of need, and ended up in the same floating debris in space that Badgie would end up in. Peanut Hamper returned again in the third season in the episode titled A Mathematically Perfect Redemption, which will probably stand as the weirdest episode of Lower Decks ever. At the end of that episode, she was taken into custody at the Daystrom Institute and placed next to another AI named Agamus. Agamus, who was first introduced in the second season episode Where Pleasant Fountains Lie, is a sentient computer that tricked a planet's inhabitants into fighting a war by posing as a supernatural being. In the episode in which he debuted, Boimler and Mariner crash land on a planet while transporting Agamus to the Daystrom Institute, where Agamus attempts to turn the two against each other, only for Boimler to get the upper hand in the end. Agamus is voiced by the very versatile Jeffrey Combs, who has appeared as more characters on Star Trek than any other actor. The Cerritos arrives at the coordinates of the distress call and find the Drukmani ship that has been taken over by Badgie. When Rutherford first sees Badgie, he has a profane response, which I believe is a reference to Data's same reaction upon realizing that the saucer section of the Enterprise D was about to impact a planet in the film Star Trek Generations. Rutherford confronts Badgie on the ship and confesses that he was wrong in treating him the way that he did in their prior encounter. This causes Badgie to split into two different beings, each with its own personality. This is a reference to the original series episode The Enemy Within, where a transporter malfunction causes Captain Kirk to be split into two people, one good, the other evil. After Agamus is able to escape and capture both Boimler and Tendi, he takes them to a remote beach where he had planned to meet Peanut Hamper. Tendi is preoccupied by playing in the sand, which is actually a callback to the first episode ever of Lower Decks, Second Contact, where she is introduced to sand for the first time in her life. Agamus also uses devices that he refers to as murder drones that look very similar to the drones used by the automated defense system shown in the Next Generation episode titled The Arsenal of Freedom. Back on the Cerritos, the evil version of Badgie has taken over the ship's system and begins to flood the ship with a substance known as Neurocene gas. This toxic smoke was first introduced in the Deep Space Nine episode Civil Defense and was used by the Cardassians during their occupation of the planet Bajor. Coincidentally, that episode of DS9 dealt with the crew trying to defeat a deadly automated security system very similar to what Agamus has become now on Lower Decks. Rutherford decides that the only way to defeat the evil version of Badgie is by using logic. This is very similar to the way that Captain Kirk and Spock defeated the evil computer known as Landru in the original series episode titled The Return of the Archons. After Peanut Hamper does not meet up with Agamus after their escape, Tendi is able to find her on the Tyrus Research Station. This station was introduced in the Next Generation episode that also introduced the Exocomps, The Quality of Life. Eventually, Badgie is able to upload himself into a subspace relay that transmits him to every ship in the Federation simultaneously. One of the ships that we see get taken over by Badgie is the USS Vancouver, which was shown in the first season episode, Cupid's Errant Arrow, along with Boimler's former girlfriend, Barbara Brinson, who appears to still be serving on the ship in the scene. Badgie decides that now with omnipotent power, he no longer wishes to destroy the Federation, and instead ascends to a higher plane of existence. Before he does, he mentions a place called the Black Mountain, and then sees a koala bear above him. The Black Mountain, along with the Great Koala, are spiritual constructs that revolve around death and have been mentioned a few times before on Lower Decks, as recently as in an episode from earlier this season titled The Cradle of Vexilon, when after it appeared that Boimler had been killed in the line of duty, he saw a Black Mountain and was told by a koala bear that it was not his time. This entry very smartly plays off more than one classic Star Trek trope by putting the main characters in a very familiar setting to fans of the franchise. 
We also got a sort of clip show in this episode of events that have already occurred but had not been seen on screen. This chapter also brings back an alien race from the original animated series and allows us to catch up with a few members of the Cerritos crew that we have seen in prior episodes. But before I get into everything I noticed, I want to thank you very much for clicking on this video and ask that you please hit that like button if you enjoy what you hear. Also, don't forget to subscribe so that YouTube lets you know when my future videos and podcasts come out. In case you are not aware, I also have a weekly podcast named WDIM News that comes out every Monday where I review Star Trek episodes and news, along with other things in the world of science fiction. This episode of Lower Decks begins with Boimler, Mariner, Tendi, and Rutherford all being assigned to the same mission in which they are to study a cave. Mariner is not too happy about this assignment and states that many of their missions take place in caves that all look the same, to which Boimler agrees. This is a reference to the filming of the series Star Trek The Next Generation, specifically what took place on Paramount Stage 16, which was a sound stage that was used many times when the crew took part in away missions. That sound stage, which was affectionately referred to as Planet Hell, was first utilized during the filming of the pilot episode of The Next Generation, Encounter at Farpoint. Because it costs a lot of money to build new sets, this sound stage would sometimes only be altered slightly from episode to episode, giving the audience the impression that many planets that the Enterprise D visited looked eerily familiar. During this episode of Lower Decks, even though each character has a story about a prior experience in a different location, they all look very similar, further driving home this point. But this is also a reference to the classic Star Trek trope of having one or more characters trapped in a cave with no means of escape. This has been used at least a dozen times over the various different iterations of Star Trek, with my personal favorites being the DS9 episodes Heart of Stone, in which Odo and another character are trapped in a cave, as well as the episode The Sound of Her Voice, in which the crew of the Defiant attempts to rescue a Starfleet captain who is trapped within a cave. As they try and figure a way out, Boimler is the first one to reminisce about a prior time that he was trapped, in that case with Lieutenant Levy. This character has appeared now in four episodes of Lower Decks, the first being the season one finale, No Small Parts, and is voiced by Fred Tadasiore, who voices many characters on Lower Decks, including Lieutenant Shax. Boimler and Levy cannot make contact with the Cerritos and have crashed in a shuttlecraft due to an ion storm. Ion storms are another Star Trek trope slash MacGuffin that have been used quite frequently and were first mentioned on the original series episode, Court Martial. Captain's Log, star date 2947.3. We have been through a severe ion storm. Lieutenant Levy is suspicious of everything and believes that the pair are being stalked by a race of aliens known as the Vendorians. The Vendorians are a tentacled, non-humanoid species capable of shapeshifting who were first introduced in the original animated series episode titled The Survivor. Levy accuses the Vendorians of many conspiracies, including one that tricked the Federation into believing that ships using warp drive are damaging subspace. This is a reference to events that took place during the Next Generation episode Force of Nature, in which two scientists, who were apparently Vendorians, inform the crew of the Enterprise D that warp drive is destructive to the fabric of subspace. Rutherford then reveals that he was also trapped in a cave during a mission, in his case with Dr. Ta'ana, and that he had a child. This is a reference to the Star Trek Enterprise episode titled Unexpected, in which the ship's male chief engineer Trip Tucker is unknowingly impregnated by an alien species. When Rutherford is touched by the alien and impregnated, you can briefly see a shimmer effect on his face similar to the one used on Trip Tucker in that episode of Enterprise. Mariner then tells her story about being trapped with members of Delta Ship. These characters appeared in the first season episode, Terminal Provocations, and are the fourth duty shift on the Cerritos after the Alpha, Beta, and Gamma shift crews. This concept was first mentioned on screen during the two-part Next Generation episode, Chain of Command, where then-Captain Edward Jellico wished to eliminate one of the four standard shifts on the Enterprise D. This episode of TNG also had a plotline in which members of the crew must train for a dangerous mission within a planet's underground cave system, and was filmed in part on the Planet Hell set. Mariner, as well as the members of Delta Shift, experience rapid aging or de-aging thanks to the presence of chronotons, which are sub-atomic particles with temporal or time-altering properties and are known to be used in some cloaking devices. Chronotons are another well-used Star Trek MacGuffin that were first mentioned during the Next Generation episode, The Next Phase, as the cause of LaForge and Ro Laren being phased out of known reality due to a Romulan cloaking device in the area. Rapid aging or de-aging is another commonly used Star Trek trope, with the first instance being on the original series episode titled The Deadly Years, where members of the Enterprise crew age rapidly due to radiation from a planet. But the episode I remember best is the Next Generation episode Rascals, where four adult characters are reverted to their 12-year-old state after a transporter malfunction. 
When Tendi finally gets to tell the story she has been trying to tell since the mission began, it turns out that it takes place immediately after the end of the first episode ever of Lower Decks, titled Second Contact. Since the animation style on Lower Decks has been slightly altered since the first season, it appears that all the scenes from the first episode that appear in this new episode have been recreated instead of using the original footage. While the four are trapped in a turbo lift, Ensign Tenny reveals that she was forced to relieve herself in the corner. I believe that this is a reference to an episode of the American sitcom The Office titled Nepotism, in which at one point, the characters Dwight and Pam are trapped in an elevator and are forced to make a similar decision. Stop drinking the water! Being trapped in a turbo lift is another trope that has been used a few times on Star Trek before, with my favorite episode being The Forsaken from, once again, Deep Space Nine, in which Odo and Luxana Troy are trapped together. In the end, it appears as though it was the Vendorians who have created this situation for the crew, and they decide not to allow the Cerritos to contact them yet so that the four can enjoy their time together longer. This is possibly another reference to the aforementioned episode of The Next Generation titled Rascals, since in that episode, after the other three characters are reverted back to their original age, Ensign Roe decides to remain a child for a bit longer to enjoy the experience. The title of the episode may be a reference to one of the most popular episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation ever, named The Inner Light. In that episode, Captain Jean-Luc Picard is struck unconscious by an energy beam from an alien probe. The probe makes Picard experience 40 years of life as Cayman, a humanoid scientist whose planet is threatened by its own sun. The probe is later found to contain a flute, which Picard keeps as a memento for the remainder of that series and is seen on Star Trek Picard. This episode begins with the Lower Decks crew visiting some outpost scientists on a planet named Parasoff 9. The planet's name could be a reference to actor Nehemiah Parasoff, who besides appearing in the Next Generation episode, The Most Toys, also voiced the character Papa Mouskowitz in the popular animated American Tales series of films. After the intro, we see Talyn and Boimler discussing Mariner's recent behavior, and Talyn states that Mariner seems to have become more reckless since their mission on Ferenginar. This is a reference to the sixth episode of this season of Lower Decks, titled Parth Ferengi's Heart Place, and in that episode, a friend of Mariner's named Quimp told her that she needed to figure out what is bothering her. Since the four Lower Decks officers were promoted to Lieutenant Junior Grade at the beginning of this season, Mariner has apparently never felt comfortable in the role, and in this episode, the audience gets a better idea of why that is. The two are surprised to see that both Rutherford and Tendi have also been called to speak with the captain and that Mariner is absent. The captain wants to understand what is going on with her daughter, but also has a mission. It seems that the mysterious enemy that has been attacking non-Federation ships is now also targeting specific civilians as well. First, all the ships that are believed to have gone missing are shown, and we see a Binar ship that was attacked in the seventh episode this season, A Few Badgies More. We also see the Romulan ship taken in the second episode this season, I Have No Bones Yet I Must Flee, as well as the Ferengi ship taken in the aforementioned episode featuring them, Parth Ferengi's Heart Place, and lastly, the Orion ship taken in the fourth episode this season, Something Borrowed Something Green. Commander Ransom describes these civilians as ex-Starfleet officers, and they are Seven of Nine, Beverly Crusher, Thomas Riker, and Nicholas Locarno. Now, if you did not watch the series Picard, you may be confused as to why Seven and Beverly Crusher are on this list, as the last time we saw them on their respective series, Star Trek Voyager and The Next Generation, they were serving on Starfleet ships. It was explained throughout the first season of Picard that Seven did not join Starfleet upon Voyager's return to the Alpha Quadrant at the end of that series. Seven would instead join a group of vigilantes known as the Fenris Rangers before meeting Picard some years later. Then, in the third season of Picard, the audience learns that it was because of her past as a member of the Borg Collective that Seven was rejected from serving in Starfleet. However, due to her actions during the series, Seven is eventually accepted as a member of Starfleet and given the rank of Commander. Dr. Beverly Crusher left the Enterprise E and Starfleet roughly two years after the events of the film Star Trek Nemesis. This is because she had decided to raise her son, whom Jean-Luc Picard was the father of, in complete secret. This, as well as her son's lineage, make up a good portion of the story of the entire third season of Star Trek Picard. So if you do want to know more about what happens to Beverly and Seven, I suggest you watch that series. The next two names on the list have a lot more in common than being played by actors known on Star Trek for other roles. The first, Thomas Riker, is a clone of William Riker, who was created after a transporter accident in the Next Generation episode, Second Chances. Even though both men had an equal right to be Will Riker, Thomas decided to use his middle name as his first and then start his own life away from the Enterprise-D. Thomas would then reappear in the Deep Space Nine episode, Defiant, and after using his likeness as Will Riker to trick the crew of DS9 and the USS Defiant, he attempts to steal the ship and use it for the cause of the Maquis. 
who were a resistance group made up of former Federation officers and citizens. Thomas ends up surrendering himself and the Defiant so that his crew can survive, and he is then sent to a Cardassian labor camp where it was believed that he was killed after the Maquis were all but wiped out during the Dominion War. Nicholas Locarno was a cadet in Starfleet Academy at the same time that Wesley Crusher was there, and both were part of a flight team known as Nova Squadron. After an accident was responsible for the death of one of the members of Nova Squad, Locarno convinced the others, including Wesley, to lie about the event so that they would not be punished. In the end, much like Thomas Riker, Locarno takes the blame for the incident so that the surviving members of his team do not receive a punishment and because of this, he is expelled from Starfleet Academy. Events that take place in the Next Generation episode, The First Duty. Nick Locarno was played by actor Robert Duncan McNeil, who would later be cast as a very similar character named Tom Paris on the series Star Trek Voyager. Star Trek producer Jerry Taylor admitted that Nick Locarno is the inspiration for the Tom Paris character and that Locarno was almost used on Voyager, but in the end, the writers felt his actions at Starfleet Academy made him irredeemable. Robert Duncan McNeil stated in an interview that while there are obvious similarities between the two characters, that he played them quite differently. In his words, Locarno seemed like a nice guy, but deep down he was a bad guy. Tom Paris is an opposite premise in a way. Deep down he's a good guy, he just made some mistakes. Mariner is sent with Boimler, Tendi, and Talin to a malfunctioning weather buoy where they are come upon by a Klingon bird of prey. The way the ship suddenly appears in front of their shuttle is very similar to how the bounty scared some whale fishermen in the film Star Trek The Voyage Home. The four are able to beam down to the planet before the shuttle is destroyed. There they find members of the various ships that have gone missing, including members of a Klingon vessel that was last seen in the season 4 premiere, Tuvix. Meanwhile, Rutherford with Captain Freeman and Lieutenant Shax are looking for Nick Locarno on another planet, where Rutherford suddenly discovers that his uniform has pockets. This is a reference to the long-running mystery slash joke as to why the uniforms that the characters wear on the original series as well as for most of the next generation and on do not have pockets. This is because Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry believed that uniforms look more futuristic without pockets, so he insisted that his characters did not need them. This is also why the uniforms of the characters on Star Trek Enterprise do have pockets, since that series takes place before the events of the original series and is therefore less futuristic. They then try to get into a seedy establishment named Mudd's, which is no doubt a reference to the smuggler Harry Mudd. He was first played by actor Robert C. Carmel in two episodes of the original series and is the only guest actor to reprise their role on that series. The character was later reimagined during the series Discovery and was played then by Rain Wilson in two episodes along with a short trek that was dedicated to his character. The bouncer does not let them in, but does let in a mysterious bounty hunter, along with an alien known as an Endosian. This four-legged species was first introduced on the original animated series in the form of a new member of the bridge crew named Erex. Lower Decks brought back the species in an episode from their first season titled Much Ado About Boimler. After beaming to the planet, the four decide to rest before searching for a possible way to escape. Mariner does not want to wait for the others and sneaks out of their camp while a dreaming Boimler says, Teach me how to tap dance, Beverly Crusher. This is a reference to the Next Generation episode Data's Day, in which Dr. Beverly Crusher attempts to teach Data how to dance. Because of her impatience, she is attacked by a member of the Klingon crew and together they become stuck together in a cave. There, she confesses that the reason she does not wish to be promoted is that a fellow cadet that she looked up to named Sito was killed on a Starfleet mission after being stationed on the Enterprise-D. Sito Jaxa is a Bajoran character that was first introduced as a different member of Nova Squadron in the aforementioned episode of The Next Generation, The First Duty. After the events of that episode, she graduated from Starfleet Academy and within two years was serving aboard the Enterprise D, where Captain Picard and others took a special interest in her. Unfortunately, she was sent on a covert assignment where it was believed that she was killed in action during the TNG episode Lower Decks, an episode that faithfully is the inspiration for this series which shares the same name. Mariner also mentions that she took part in the Dominion War, which was a major event that saw different alien factions band together and was seen during the course of the series Deep Space Nine. It had been established during the first season of Lower Decks that Mariner served aboard the USS Quito and was docked at Deep Space Nine before she served on the USS Cerritos, but this is the first mention of her actually serving during the war itself. The Captain, Shax, and Rutherford finally gain access to MUDs where they meet a character known as the Information Broker, who appears to be the same species as Baylock's puppet that was seen in the original series episode The Corbo Might Maneuver. The captain believes it is a puppet, but instead it turns out to be a small being more similar to Baylock's actual form in that episode. Mariner tries to rally the rest of the alien crews on the planet, but is attacked by the Orion captain. Tendi is able to stop her attack, and she is then referred to by the captain as the Mistress of the Winter Constellations, 
In an episode from this season of Lower Decks, titled Something Borrowed, Something Green, the audience learned that Tendi is the heiress to a noble family within the Orion Syndicate, but she instead chose to leave that life behind and join Starfleet. It turns out that the captain had a different plan altogether, and the mysterious bounty hunter is revealed to be a disguised Andy Billups. I can't help but think that this is a shot at the Disney series The Mandalorian, which features a character in a full mask for most of its episodes. They are able to find the hideout of Nick Locarno, and there they find the design schematics that resemble the mysterious ship that they have been searching for. The fact that Nick Locarno is the designer of this ship may also be a reference to his connection to the character Tom Paris, who built the shuttlecraft known as the Delta Flyer in the Star Trek Voyager episode Extreme Risk. This entry begins with a recap of the last episode's events, which saw Nicholas Locarno return as the character who designed the ship that has been stealing non-Federation ships and marooning their senior staff on a planet. The audience also learned in last week's episode that while at Starfleet Academy, Beckett Mariner began to look up to another cadet named Sito Jaxa, who also appeared in two episodes of The Next Generation. I will talk about both characters in this video, but I did an in-depth look at both in my breakdown of last week's episode, which you should definitely check out if you like this week's episode. The season finale begins with a flashback to 13 years ago at Starfleet Academy, where we see Beckett Mariner as a first-year cadet. This scene takes place right before the events of the Next Generation episode, The First Duty, which marked the debut of both Nicholas Locarno and Cito Jaxa. Along with these two characters, we also see the return of Wesley Crusher in animated form, voiced by Will Wheaton. Surprisingly, this is Wesley's first appearance on Lower Decks after Will Wheaton had reprised this role during Star Trek Picard's second season and is also the host of the official Star Trek after show, The Ready Room. His appearance is also a reunion of sorts with actor Jerry O'Connell, who voices Commander Ransom, since as children, they both starred in the Stephen King-inspired film, Stand By Me. The fourth member of Nova Squadron, Joshua Albert, is one whom we are seeing for the first time, as he was the cadet who was killed during the attempted maneuver. There is also another member of the team who did appear in the first duty, named Gene Hajar, who is not seen in this flashback. Besides Will Wheaton and Robert Duncan McNeil reprising their roles as Wesley Crusher and Nicholas Locarno, Shannon Phil returns to voice the role that she played on TNG, Cito Jaxa. This is Shannon Phil's first acting credit since 1995, and according to the internet, she has been working as a clinical social worker in Sunland, California. Cito and the rest of the group are then approached by a young and very excited Beckett Mariner who mentions learning about two aliens, the Preservers and the Zindi. The Preservers are one of the oldest known alien races in the Star Trek universe and were introduced in the original series episode titled The Paradise Syndrome. The Zindi are a very interesting and ancient alien race that consists of at least six different species who were the main antagonists for much of the third season of Star Trek Enterprise. In the present time, we see that Mariner has been transported to Locarno's ship, which is the same ship that the audience has seen stealing other ships since the first episode this season. The insignia on Locarno's vest is the same design as the starburst maneuver that Nova Squad attempted to pull off that led to the death of his classmate. After revealing his plan to incite mutiny among as many ships as possible to Mariner, Locarno transmits a signal that the USS Cerritos picks up. Rutherford points out that Locarno looks exactly like Tom Paris, which Boimler does not seem to notice. This is not only funny because Robert Duncan McNeil plays both roles, but because the audience learned that Boimler is also a huge fan of Tom Paris and even has a commemorative plate with his face on it from the season 2 episode, We'll Always Have Tom Paris. Locarno describes Nova Fleet as the first independent fleet in the galaxy, to which Boimler points out that the Maquis would like to have a word. The Maquis were a resistance group that were made up of former Starfleet officers and citizens displaced by the Cardassian military, and who were a big part of the series Deep Space Nine and Voyager. Locarno also reveals that if he is attacked, he will retaliate with a Genesis device that he stole from the Ferengi. This particular device was seen earlier this season in the episode Parth Ferengi Heart Place. The first Genesis device that was seen on screen was in the film The Wrath of Khan and was detonated at the end of that movie. After Mariner turns on Locarno, Captain Freeman, who is also Mariner's mother, decides to defy Starfleet's orders and goes after her daughter anyway. This is a very common trope used in Star Trek, of officers disobeying orders to go after their friends, which virtually every crew has done, perhaps most famously in the film The Search for Spock. While Captain Freeman is making her speech about going after Mariner, we see other parts of the ship and crew, including Goodgy, the good version of the evil AI created by Rutherford named Badgy, that survived the events of an episode from earlier this season titled A Few Badgies More. Mariner is able to escape by piloting a decommissioned Steam Runner class Starfleet ship named the USS Bassaro. This class of ship has appeared in the background of episodes of Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and Picard, but has not been featured on screen until this episode of Lower Decks. 
The design of this class does seem to resemble a proto-design of the California class, which the USS Cerritos is, as both class of ships have larger saucer sections with two trailing nacelles and a similar style deflector dish. The USS Pissarro is dedicated to Fabio Pissarro, who worked as a digital artist for the Star Trek franchise for many years before his passing in 2022. Besides being named after him, the ship's registry number 52670 was also his birthday. Without the help of Starfleet, Tendi decides to reach out to her family, mainly her sister to Erica. This character was introduced earlier this season in the episode Something Borrowed Something Green and is voiced by Ariel Winter, who is best known for her role on the long-running family sitcom Modern Family. This leads to Tendi having to sacrifice her career in Starfleet and return to her family so that the captain does not have to hand over the Cerritos. Since the first episode of Lower Decks, titled Second Contact, Tendi has talked about her past as an Orion and how she has worked so hard to put it behind her. Even though she ends up off the ship at the end of the episode, Lower Decks has made a habit of removing characters in the final episode of a season only to have them return the next season, such as when Boimler left the ship to join the USS Titan at the end of the first season and how the captain was removed from the ship at the end of the third season. The Orion ship that they are given is very large but old, and Rutherford along with Livick are having trouble working together to get it operational. In order to solve their dispute, they enter a simulation on the holodeck in which they both play an exaggerated version of Mark Twain. This method of problem resolution was first used in the aforementioned episode from earlier this season, Something Borrowed Something Green, in which Boimler and Rutherford used the program to solve their problems as roommates. The use of Mark Twain in both episodes is a reference to the character's appearance in the Next Generation episode, Time's Arrow. Mariner is cornered by Locarno and his fleet, which forces her to enter an ion storm to evade him there. This scene is very similar to the battle between the Enterprise and Khan, Noonie, and Singh in the film The Wrath of Khan that took place in the Mutara Nebula. There are also many musical cues that appear in both scenes. Since Captain Freeman is at the helm of the Orion ship, Brad Boimler is tasked with commanding the USS Cerritos. This is the first time we have seen Boimler at the helm of a ship since the third season episode, Crisis Point 2 Paradoxus, where Boimler played the captain of a Starfleet vessel on the holodeck. Many of Boimler's mannerisms from that episode return, including his posture in the captain's chair, which seems to be based on one of Boimler's heroes, Captain Riker, who he served with briefly during the second season of Lower Decks. Captain Freeman then makes it through the hole in the shields caused by the destruction of the Orion ship using the captain's yacht from the USS Cerritos. This type of support vessel is built into many Starfleet ships, including both the Enterprise D and E, and was seen in the film Star Trek Insurrection. They are able to save Mariner, but Locarno is killed when he is unable to disarm the Ferengi Genesis device in time. After the device explodes, the result looks very similar to the Starbus maneuver that Locarno and Nova Squadron attempted when they were at Starfleet Academy. Back on the Cerritos, the crew decides to celebrate by chanting Lower Decks. This mirrors the ending of the first episode of the series, Second Contact, we saw the characters in a similar situation. Well, that was everything I saw, but let me know in the comments if I missed anything. Thank you once again for watching. Please remember to hit that like button before you go, and I'll see you next time on What Did I Miss?